just going to start and I'll kind of direct questions to the panelists as they come up. We have some that you all have sent ahead of time when you registered. And we have a couple live questions that I want to start with too. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to type them in the Zoom chat or in the Zoom Q&A. The first question, I'm wondering if maybe Max and Salima, you might be interested to reflect on. I'll read it out now. It seems kind of relevant to your talks. It says, what is a more realistic approach to anti-imperialism? One, transformation of the existing world system. Two, delinking and creation of a socialist non-capitalist one in parallel. Or three, destruction of the existing one in substitution with a more egalitarian one. But basically at the, co the core they're asking, who should take the lead, core, periphery, or a synergy of the two as a transnational movement? It's a lot of questions about kind of like transnational solidarity and the role of anti-imperialism and world structure, all of those things that I don't know, you two might be interested to start off with reflections. And then after that, we have a question for Francisco also in the Q&A. So I'll pass to either one of you if you have any thoughts that, yeah, it's a very technical question, but yeah. Well, I'll go first. I mean, it's it, uh, it it's a huge question. It seems it seems to me that maybe the different paths are hard, in fact, to detangle because the I mean, if the world system is constituted by polarized accumulation, uneven exchange, uh, ongoing primitive accumulation, and so forth, the process of delinking is a process of building an alternative while at the same time uh, setting in motion the. Uh, are dismantling the world system as it currently exists, right? And of course, uh, it's clear because uh, you know the, the the most oppressed people uh, facing the most surplus value extraction, most vicious exploitation in the zone of storms and some Armenian terms are in the periphery. That's where that project will start. Uh, if that project doesn't encounter synergy in uh, the north, then we are in for very violent. Things ahead. We're in for, there'll be a lot of violence no matter what, uh, but uh, one can really hope that as these movements, the movements already exist in, in Venezuela and Zimbabwe and Cuba and, and elsewhere uh, in terms of setting in motion uh, more self-reliant accumulation from below, uh, delinking, um, and they've encountered a lot of oppression and if they hopefully that oppression can be reduced so those experiments have more chance of success. Uh, I don't really have too much to add. I Could I actually, Camden, answer the other question that came through yeah. earlier, which is similar, but yeah, it comes at it from Jamaica, from, from the South? Yeah, yeah I can yeah. give you a question in full please, just to, so people have the context. Um, so that question was, what are the most effective economic strategies to reduce economic dependence and to effectively compete with imperialist powers? That's from Rosalia Hamilton from Jamaica. Hi, Rosalia, if you're in the audience. Thanks for the question, Rosalia. I'll just use that to talk a little bit more on the theoretical level. And this... Uh, this kind of step-by-step -step analysis is something that could be done in any country, I think, not only those of the South, to really give us the tools and the vision to delink or to conquer capitalism. So what Samir Amin says about forms of transfer, we really need to understand what is being seeped out of our societies uh, by capitalists for, at home and capitalists from abroad? We need to look at this historically. How has it changed over time? What is similar? You know, what is continuing? We then need to map resistance to this seeping out of resources and labor and breath and heart and soul. We need to understand the weaknesses in the resistance. What are the barriers to unity in our spaces? And then we have to imagine a new political economy. So what is it that we need internally that we can respond to internally? 
what do we need from outside? And what are the ecological demands in our, in our societies today? Because there is a lot of ecological pressure, as we know, COVID is one uh, symptom of that. When we understand those external needs, I think that is where we can start to make global links in our resistance. But we do need to start uh, in our own spaces and, and really get a grip on what our own leaders are doing that is not helpful and how it links to the, 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 the hegemonic cycle of the moment. From there, we need to organize. And that's why I wanted to end with the idea of zero COVID because that's a hands-on strategy of organizing. There's a lot of you know, mental understanding, popular education that we need to do to, to make that possible, but it is about organizing. It's not about protesting simply, which we have a lot of now, but we actually need to, to put in place new structures that answer to our problems. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks both of you for tackling so many big issues. Uh, we have a question for Francisco too in the Q&A that is, does SDR creation cause inflation? What is a long-term solution that does not rely on the IMF to bring artificial wealth back into the global south? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, you know, it gets at one of the main criticisms of not simply this proposal, but of any proposal to expand the money supply in order to um, deal with a crisis. So, you know, I, I don't think it would be inflationary. Um, we've seen previous examples uh, of what would probably happen with this money. So first, um, anyone who has lived through an IMF uh, bailout package knows that when the IMF says it's bailing out a government, in reality, it's bailing out that government's creditors, right? So that money is, you know, th those SDRs will be created. They will be deposited into central bank's um, accounts of the IMF. They will exchange those SDRs for dollars and euros. And then those dollars and euros will end up um, either right back at multilateral lenders like the IMF and the World Bank or in the pockets of bankers in New York, uh, London, Paris. Uh, and other major financial centers. Um, and those people are already rich and do not spend that much money. So the, 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 the chance that this money gets passed on, that this money actually gets spent um, is quite low because it's most likely gonna end up in the pockets of some of the richest people on the planet. Um, the other uh, example we can point to, uh, again, here in the US, we have been, um, fighting to get these bills uh, described as relief measures and not as stimulus, right? Um, these, most of this money that, is be, that would be created, again, would go to pay off creditors, right? It's not about adding um, money to people who are, who are doing well and can spend it and um, you know, kind of lead to some kind of uh, you know, inflationary exuberance. It is most likely going to be used to pay down debt. So, and to, and to meet other needs. Right, so, you know, and then in, in terms of a long-term solution, right, so there are, you know, in the short term, what I said is we, we can ask the IMF to print the money, um, we can pressure the US government to, to not block it. Um, in the medium term, we a way for government to simply... Salima, I think your mic is on. Um, in the long term, we need, you know, in the medium term, we need a way for government to be able to declare bankruptcy. And in the long term, we need to you know, uh, explore the solutions that Max and, and Salim have been talking about. These countries need to be able to produce what they need, right? And we see this, we're seeing a very clear example of this right now, right? So there's only so many countries that can produce vaccines uh, and there's only so many few countries that can develop vaccines, right? And in an ideal world, uh, we would share that technology. You would say, hey, there are, there are global needs um, we have global technologies. Let's apply you know, our global resources to meet our global needs. We know that's not what happens, right? What happens is 
Pfizer and Moderna and them say, we need to protect our patents in order to protect our profits. Um, and, you know, so in, in short of greater global cooperation, which would be the real ideal solution, then countries need to turn to forms of economic nationalism and delinking where they say, okay, we're going to have to become more self-reliant and be able to not only produce our own vaccines, but develop them as well, right? Because we can't trust that the countries that do have these capacities will share them with us in our time of need. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Francisco, for all those details and information. Uh, we have a question for Manuel, too. Um, it came in Spanish, but I'm going to give it in English for the translators. Um, it's talking about uh, there's the internal crisis on the one hand in the US. On the other hand, there's the advancement of other countries and their alliances. How much does that affect the hegemonic capacity of the US to stay as the world's hegemon and main imperialist force? And that's from Juan Alberto Sanchez Marin from Colombia. So I'll pass to Manuel. Thanks. Well, that's a good question. I think that uh, internally in the U.S., the Republican Party seems uh, in intent to continue dragging the United States down and continue putting it in an internal crisis, a crisis without precedent. Just today, Liz Cheney, the, the, the uh, Congresswoman, was removed from her leadership post because she was uh, against uh, the claims that the elections were stolen. Donald Trump's elections were stolen. So the Republican Party seems to be going down in, in the rabbit hole of continuing this internal schizophrenic crisis that the United States is living. Uh, all their intention is to bring the Biden's presidency down and to, and this will of course affect, we will continue affecting the credibility or so-called so credibility uh, that the United States would have as the leader, as a world leader uh, in, in the world. But on the other hand, the, the, the question about alliances is very important, alliances in, in the rest of the world. I think all these alliances are, all, are very questionable today, right? Only three or four years ago, or before Trumpism and, and Brexit, we were talking about very important counterweights to the US like the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, we, were, we also had a, a very strong, uh, strength, strong fortification of a South American or Latin American alliance against US hegemony and so on. And I think uh, these alliances are very much, uh, if not debilitated, or worse than the military are broken today. Huh? I'd like to see how, I land, and if we had more time, question how South Africa countries are doing, although the South African uh, development cooperation area and so on. But I think that, that, that the world is at great peril today because alliances that we took for granted some years ago are also crumbling, even the, not to mention the European Union and Brexit, of course, but even, even the United Kingdom seems to be at peril of the, of, of breaking down in Scotland, getting independent from the UK. Um, so it's a good question. And I think we are in a very, very uh, important uh, moment of, of uh, the future of international relations. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Manuel. I just want to pause quick if, Salim, I don't know if you wanted to address the point he just raised about South Africa. And uh, after that, we'll have a question from Sagari uh, to, to wrap up. Oh, wait, sorry, you just said no thanks for, for time. Sake. Okay, well, let me, let me just <laughs> jump in. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead, yeah. I think, I think that the, much of what is breaking down is, is uh, what, what we need to let go of. You know, whether it is um, the, the European Union, In Latin America, it is it's a bit more complicated because uh, there there was a lot of alternatives that were coming into being, but I think the moment allows us to think what was missing, even in the pink tide, and and definitely in Africa, the the, the loss has been for decades the loss of unity or the loss of regionalism. 
we lost it at the end of the 70s. So it's a moment for us to think what could have been done differently in many of the post-independence states. And, um, and I think it points to something that we have talked about a little bit today, or we've actually used in our presentations. Have we, as, as radicals or leftists or whatever, have we anti-capitalists, have we really given tools? Have we given the kinds of educational groundings that are needed to really change our situation. I think it's, it's, it's a huge weakness uh, that we need to start looking at. And you know, some of what has happened during COVID with um, these international links through technological means, that has helped us to reach out more. But I think, and it has also impeded us from organizing locally but I think as we get a handle on the pandemic, we need to go down to, to the very basic levels of organizing and, and think structurally when we organize our fights. Awesome. Thanks so much, Salima. Uh, we're a bit over time and I just wanna respect you know, people's time. So we're just gonna end now with a question for Sagari that came in. Um, it asks, what about the rise of populism in developing economies, especially in India, where autocracy is eroding democracy and economic gains? And that's from Garanga Das from Republic of Korea. So I'll pass to Sagari now. Thanks, Garanga, for your question. In the Indian context in particular, we have to remember that the populism we see today is really shaped by the Hindu fascist agenda of the politics or the political powers that control India today. It is really advancing that agenda, which is, you know, fascism and capitalism and this whole idea that India, which is a democratic, secular state, is the need for it to become what, what is the desire, the ideology of a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu state. So the populism that is coming in in all kinds of forms at one level is to advance this agenda. And at the other level, it also is the biggest block to organizing and the resistance towards the structures of oppression, right? So these, the, so even if it is, for instance, you have, I mean, I, I don't think we have the time to go into the details, but I would really say that today, it is a very strong reason why organizing very systematically against the structures of oppression, be they Brahminical patriarchy, be they capitalism, be they we have the system of caste. So all of these coming together and how they play out. Um, and then within the pandemic scenario, where you know, I would say that even the potential of organizing, whether it's resisting and organizing something different where you are, or whether it is even the kinds of protests that we've been seeing today, you know. So during this time. Anyone who is talking about or organizing against these structures of oppression are being then just taken away, put behind bars, the kinds of human rights violations that we see at this time, for instance. But I think that's the most important point that the populism is being, it is about the hegemony of a certain ideology in the Indian context today. And of course that is being clearly, um, you know, at this moment, when we have, we see what's unfolding in India in terms of the COVID and the kind of neglect that the state has, and of course it has to do with the commodification of healthcare and so much else. At this very moment, just a day ago or two days ago, the prime minister of this country and the government is negotiating with the EU on the new trade agreement. So at the end of the day, even it is finally also the interests of capitalism, which are being met today, you know, and they're not going to speak out. So I see that that exactly is the situation as we see it. Yeah, thanks, Alinda. Amazing. Thank you, Sagari. Uh, thanks to all of the panelists. Thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you to our amazing interpreters for keeping up with us, with us even when we were too fast. 
Um, and yeah, just thanks for coming today, for spending time with us and kind of starting to uncover some of these facts. Just want to emphasize as all the panelists have really spoken to and the song at the beginning, organizing is what will change any of these systems at the end of the day. So I hope that, you know, some of this information thinking we can take back to our own context and we'll be in touch too with, you know, follow-ups of links and resources and as we keep building work and connecting. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone. Feel free to get in touch. You know, we have an email address in the Zoom chat if you have any questions for panelists, anyone you want to get in touch with. And thanks again to everyone so much for taking the time, extra time today too. Bye everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Thanks so much.